Greetings adventurers, my name is Kramer. Strap in. This is going to be a long one because it has to be a long video. And there are disclaimers I need to make. If you're not interested, use the timestamps, skip around, watch it in parts if you have to. And I'll endeavor to make it all as entertaining as possible given the subject material. This year, on April 26th, I attended Reckoning 2. This is their second event. I have been to both of them. And after this event, I feel it necessary to now share my experience. I have tempered my experience and my interpretation of how events went down by speaking to other players as well as members of current staff and previous staff. To protect the integrity of all of those who were kind enough to speak with me and answer my questions, I am not going to be sharing the names of any of those people or any direct quotes from them in an attempt to protect their anonymity. If any of those people, and you know who you are, would like to share your experiences in the comments below please by all means do so. If you make a video or something about it, I'd be happy to share it too if you would like your version of the experience heard. But at least when it comes to my own content, I feel that protecting the anonymity of these people is necessary just because I don't want to be responsible for potentially burning bridges for other people or having people's reputations at stake, not to be dramatic or anything like that. So this video is comprised of my opinions and mostly publicly available information. There is the potential with videos like this for people's feelings to get hurt. That is not my intention, and if that is the result, then I am sorry, but I do not apologize for what it is that I am about to say. In its current state, and based off of my experience, I will not be attending Reckoning 3. Nor, if asked, would I recommend it. Which is a huge shame because the player base and the volunteers are a fantastic community, and it pains me to have to leave them. To my fellow players and the volunteers and the staff, etc., I sincerely hope that you are not hurt by this. This video is not a comment on you. I greatly enjoyed playing with all of you, and I would happily do so again at another event or at Reckoning again someday in the future if it does fix the problems that I have with it. I really hope we get that chance again. To the staff and the volunteers specifically, you have my full respect. You are clearly giving it your all and I thank you for doing what you could in order to make it a good experience. Lots of people had fun at Reckoning, so this is not me trying to tell you that you shouldn't have had fun at Reckoning or that you shouldn't go again if you would like to. I had fun too, but for me, fun is kind of the bare minimum that I expect when I'm going to an event where I get to dress up in armor and fight people with a sword. I'll find a way to have fun. Fun is sort of implied, and that means that fun is not necessarily a good indicator, at least for me, as to the quality of the experience. I am aware of the potential that I have to influence people to attend or not attend any given events. Thusly, it is my responsibility to ensure that I don't abuse that trust. This is not a moral comment on the game, or the staff, or the players, or even the game runner. And I absolutely do not endorse, encourage, or condone any attacks which might be directed at this game, or anyone affiliated with it, or even anyone who just enjoyed it as a result of this video, especially from people that didn't actually participate in the game. I think it should go without saying, but we, the living anachronism community, should not engage in that sort of behavior. All that being said, I am extremely disappointed. Year one of Reckoning was a lot of fun, and though there were issues, and a great many of them at that, it was their very first event. A proof of concept, if you will, and I was willing to overlook a lot of those issues and problems because I believed in the potential of the game, and I liked the direction that I thought it was going. And I still believe that Reckoning has an amazing amount of potential, but I also now no longer believe that the execution is there, and I'm not sure that it will be. If tangible and demonstrable changes were made to the way that the game is run, I would consider rejoining it again in the future, but right now, it does not meet my standards. Davy Chappie actually did a video, his review on season one. A couple of people had a problem with him making that video. I'm not sure why I didn't have a problem with it. I actually thought he was pretty spot on. I was just willing to forgive a lot of those things after year one, but now after year two, it brings me no pleasure to say that they took almost no steps forward based off of year one, 
at least that I was able to experience as a paying customer. And in a fair number of places, steps were actually taken backwards. A lot of them are really easily fixable, but the fact that they weren't fixed between years one and two, despite an incredibly enthusiastic player base and a very dedicated team of volunteers does make me raise an eyebrow. In some cases, there were even things that they did year one that I liked that they didn't do year two, and I have no idea why. So let's start at the very beginning, the start of the game. We arrived on Wednesday at the site for the Wednesday through Sunday event. Last year was Friday through Sunday, so this year we got two extra days, but the amount of content actually decreased from year one, meaning that a lot of those hours spent felt incredibly empty. Last year there were also signs for the site itself saying reckoning and parking that were meant to direct the player base to this official event on site. It felt very put together last year and official. And this year we arrived to the new location, which we'll get to in a second, to be greeted by a handwritten sign in Sharpie that simply said private party. Now, I might be accused right off the bat of nitpicking about that, and maybe rightfully so, but to me, as someone who paid for a $260 total ticket, private party just seems a little offhanded. I mean, like, private event at least, right? I don't know, maybe that's just me, but it didn't seem like there was pride being taken in the actual putting on of the event itself, and that just made me feel a little odd. There was no sign-in at the beginning of the game this year, even though there was last year. There was no way to confirm that people actually bought their tickets, who they were playing as, that they were attending the event, where they were staying, anything. Which organizationally, to me, of course, doesn't make any sense. That is industry standard. I could have just showed up in my costume and it would have been assumed that I had the right to be there. So combine that with the private party sign, it kind of makes everything feel like an honor system. So given that there was no sign-in and no security and no waivers that anybody signed of any kind, that also just made me feel a little bit off. Now, I later learned that there was actually supposed to be a sign-in sheet, but it ended up being accidentally locked in a U-Haul. That might be why we didn't have the reckoning and parking signs as well. I don't really think there's anything else I need to say about that. The official start time of the safety meeting was also not officially announced anywhere. At least if it was, I didn't find it. I had to ask a friend of mine when the game was technically starting, and I'm not even sure how he knew. I also didn't find out until the day of the event that this year, Feastware was not going to be provided even though it was last year. This is me. I have Feastware. I simply made the executive decision not to bring it in order to cut down on the amount of packing space because... Last year they had it, so this year I assumed they would. So on the day of the event, there was this mad scramble for me and the members of my party to find in decorum feastware appropriate utensils, bowls, etc. because this is a high immersion event and we wanted to be able to eat. The announcement that feastware would not be provided this year was made via at everyone ping on the community discord, which I don't check because it's too chaotic and I shouldn't be expected to check it for that information. New rules and new lore were also disseminated through the discord or via Instagram live stream. So if if you missed it, kinda you're out of luck. Things were not told to us via either email, which I know they had because we used it when we bought the tickets, or via the website, and I don't know why that is. So I ended up finding out about all of these very important announcements secondhand if I found out about them at all. Which brings us to safety and logistics issues. Now perhaps buying a ticket is some sort of implied contract or something, but I'm not really sure how sending someone cash through PayPal really counts legally. And I don't remember ever having to sign any sort of waiver saying that I accept all risk of injury unto myself during the event, and that is a lawsuit waiting to happen. The safety briefing did not actually go over how the rules of combat necessarily worked, other than 
them to simply say what parts of the body are illegal striking points, and even then it was very difficult to hear during the safety briefing, and there was no quiz or anything for the new players to ensure that they understood what was expected of them in order to play safely. So we ended up having issues there, we'll get to that later. This is simply not enough, especially given the amount of new players. They're just going to mimic what they see or do whatever they want. And that isn't their fault because they're new. They have to be taught. They needed a staff organized, staff run, mandatory new player combat training for everyone in order to teach people what is safe, what is legal, what is illegal, how to role play damage, how to call your shots. It is the responsibility of the game runner or the staff of the game runner to clearly explain to these new players what the vision of the game is and how to role play within the system. And the part that is particularly concerning is that there was no way to determine if a player was a minor. I don't even know if it's necessary to explain why that is such a big problem. There is alcohol, there are people swearing, there are potentially adult themes, and there is no way to legally and logistically discern who is above the age of 21 or under the age of consent. Again, this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Luckily, it didn't become a problem this year, at least not that I was aware, but still. The catering. Our meal tickets were denoted by a yellow piece of plastic which was tied around our wrist. No check was done to ensure that people had actually paid for the meal ticket, which logistically to me, again, doesn't make any sense, because if you aren't checking to make sure that the right number of people who purchase tickets actually have them, you're going to run out of food. Again, I would understand that my complaint about the yellow plastic is simply nitpicking, but I'd again like to point out that this is marketed as a high immersion event with a $260 total price tag. And it would seem that simple considerations that would have made me feel more valued as a player and that my immersion was being valued as a paying customer simply weren't taken. Something as simple as having pieces of paper that simply had a meal ticket printed on them in a nice font. Perhaps those got locked in the U-Haul too, I, I don't even know. Anyway, yellow piece of plastic. Yet at the time, this was before the event even started, I was willing to overlook these initial things in order to keep my own spirits up and not ruin my own outlook before the game even started. Though my best friend and I, and both of us went last year, did sit together before the game started and sort of share our collective sinking feeling that we had. And the food was terrible. It was bad. It was it was honestly unacceptable. Um, the meal tickets were $80 each. That is what brought the overall cost of the entire event up to $260. I don't think that turkey and ham wraps with a bag of Cheetos qualify as an immersive medieval meal. I had one player in my group actually quit the game on Saturday night before the final battle because the food quality and the portion control, quite frankly, was so unacceptable to him that he decided to leave. It, it honestly felt like I was on a high school field trip. Now word on the street is that the initial planned caterer left, and there are multiple different conjectured reasons why that might have been, um, and that this new caterer was a last minute replacement. And I don't feel bad sharing that bit of word of mouth because at this point, it's all any of us really collectively know about the subject. Ultimately, I don't even really care what the justification is. The point is that it happened and it hasn't been officially addressed to any capacity. No official explanation, no apology, no statement saying what the steps are that are being taken to avoid this from happening next year. Just, just nothing. That is astounding to me. At the end of the day, this is a business. This is an event with paying customers. I was one of them, and I lament that I didn't just take that $80 and spend it in order to prepare my own meals. Meals were also not officially announced at any particular time, nor were they served at any consistent time. You had people going up for seconds before other people even knew that dinner had been served. So those people either missed the food entirely, or when they showed up, they just had to deal with the scraps. 
Everything was done more or less on the same time span every day, so you could reasonably expect lunch to happen between the hours of noon and three, roughly. But it became such that the only reliable way of really knowing when food was going to be served soon was to keep an eye out for the actual car, which would just drive through the game in order to bring the catering supplies to the inside of the castle where the food was being served. Yes, I understand that logistically this might have been the only option possible, possible, it might have been the only way to handle the situation. Am I nitpicking? I don't know. Am I being ungrateful? I don't know. But I would like to remind you that this is a high immersion event with a $260 price tag where you are not allowed to play in the game if you dress outside of your faction's historical influence or color requirements, and you can't camp in game without a historically accurate tent, and there is a literal four-door stark white sedan driving through the camps, through the game, and into the castle three times a day. I'll also take a moment to point out that last year there was a main banquet area with feasting tables inside of a pavilion. Yes, the tables were just generic folding tables with a cloth thrown over them, but again, as a first event, that is something I am willing to overlook. It is something that is easily fixable, and fixable in the future with better resources, so fine. But this year, there weren't even feasting tables at all. Meals were served in the courtyard of Birdcell Castle, where there were a handful of benches, a number of pews and no tables. We also had access to a tavern area inside where all 300 plus players could fit standing up but not sitting down again because there were only a few number of benches lining the walls and an even smaller number of tables. Some of those tables were just the lids of barrels. So my seven friends and I got our food, sat in the courtyard, and then balanced our plates on our knees. Ultimately, the mad scramble to get those indecorum plates ended up being completely unnecessary because there actually were plates provided they were made of styrofoam, and given that there was not really a logistically feasible way for all of the players to wash all of their dishes at the end of the meal, everyone just ended up using the styrofoam. Ye old medieval styrofoam. Speaking of Bird Cell Castle, this brings us to the venue. The venue this year was changed from last year, and to be completely honest, I believe it was a downgrade from last year. Last year had its issues, of course. The grass was supposed to be mowed, and it wasn't. Okay, the ticks were a massive problem. Okay, there was poison ivy, broken glass, and barbed wire. Okay, those are all issues, but I am paying for an event where I know I'm going into the wild, so those things are kind of expected for me. But the point is that the space last year better suited the game and was also better utilized. It was a big, giant, open field in the center surrounded by woods, and within each of those wooded areas was a small clearing, and then each faction had their own camp within those clearings, and it was a bit of a journey in order to get from your camp to the main area where all of the big battles took place or from your camp to somebody else's camp. There was enough space, everyone had a fair amount of privacy, and going from place to place felt a little bit like an adventure in and of itself. This year, the venue was much, much smaller. It happened at a place called Bird Cell Castle in Indiana, and the gentleman who owns it, and it is actually his house, which is pretty epic, was kind enough to allow us to use the property. I mean, we did collectively pay him to allow us to use the property. So, I mean, like we did rent it. It wasn't just like a gift. But I am grateful that we had the space and this is in no way a knock against him. I am simply saying that for the game that Reckoning is, this space was either not utilized correctly or just wasn't the right space at all, given that Reckoning is supposed to be a game focused on interfactional warfare, skirmishes, and fairly large battles. This venue just simply didn't support the type of game that Reckoning is supposed to be. We weren't really allowed to use the castle either, again, because it is this guy's home, so completely understandable. So what we ultimately had access to was the concrete courtyard and the small tavern area on the inside. The courtyard had a sparring arena in it, and then a few pews and a stage, because this venue was also rented out for various Renaissance festivals, so I guess they used the stage for that. Inside their tavern area, there was also a stage, but the inside of the tavern area, while very cool and atmospheric, was not actually utilized by the game or any of the plot or anything. It was kind of just the place where everyone went when it started to rain outside, which is a shame. And ultimately, it felt like we were playing in somebody's backyard, because we were complete with neighbors and their houses and everything. 
The faction camps this year were all right next to, to each other. You could see if you were about to be raided by a rival faction by looking over your shoulder and observing them in their camp. The entrance to the castle, which is where you had to go if you wanted to get your food, was on the opposite side of the castle from where the camps were situated because we were camping behind the castle. So getting the food was annoying if the food was even worth the walk in the first place. And in front of the castle, there was a bazaar that the players set up to sell their wares, and in front of the bazaar there was a small field, and in front of the field was an even smaller bit of woods, and that was mostly the staging area for the monster NPCs. We weren't allowed up on the ramparts of the castle, both for safety and privacy issues, of course, and we also weren't allowed to fight inside of the courtyard unless we were specifically in the arena or doing a very small sparring match, again for safety reasons. During the main battle, we weren't even allowed to fight right in front of the gate for safety reasons. We weren't even allowed to fight near the walls of the castle itself for safety reasons. So during the big battle on Saturday night, we had to fight on the grass, slightly outside the entrance to the castle and to the right of the entrance of the castle. It was a little bit like the Battle of Winterfell all over again, just standing outside of this heavily defensive structure. It was just a backdrop, one that we couldn't even really appreciate or experience because it was behind us during the battle. It was just there, unusable and in the way, just a big obstacle to walk around. Now it's unfortunate because I can think of a couple of ways that this weakness with the venue could have been turned into a strength for the story of the game. And perhaps what I'm about to propose uh, was considered and then was dismissed for whatever logistical reasons I'm not aware of, but I can't help but imagine a version of the game where all the players are actually there to siege the castle, and the castle is used as the logistical and setup area for the NPCs, and the players are all camping outside. That way we aren't allowed into the castle mechanically, because we aren't actually allowed to use it anyway, and we're also not allowed to use it for the story because it is enemy territory. And this makes having all of our camps so close together make more sense and feel more epic because we are all there for a common goal, a common purpose purpose. And we could still have the infighting, we could still have the factional warfare, but we now have an even better reason for it because there is tension. Who should be in charge of this multifactional army? Who should get control of the castle if and when we take it over? Parties could be embezzling or stealing resources from other parties, jeopardizing the entire army as a whole anything other than what we got. Which finally brings us to the actual game. Finally, Lay On, which in LARP terms means the game is starting, you are all in character now, was technically officially called, but not everyone was organized to be there or present for it, including me, because I was camping out of game and wasn't aware that I had to be anywhere at any particular time. So I was simply told, again through the grapevine, that after weapons check, we would go get dinner, and then after we received our food, then we could just be in character. Personally, I think that the collective moment where all of the players are gathered together and then the game starts now is a very important moment. It creates this psychological effect, this mass pulling back of the theater curtain that lets everyone know that we are stepping into this new world for the next few days together now. Not having this and being told to just be in character after I receive my food essentially meant to me as a player, do whatever you want or don't. It doesn't matter. It just felt like my experience and my immersion were not the top priority of the game, which is not a good feeling. And they had a lay on moment last year where everyone was in their individual faction camps. They gathered everyone together, made sure all the players were there. And then we called lay on and then everyone marched into the main communal eating area and were heralded by our leaders. It was a great moment. It set the tone for the entire game. Why didn't they have it this year? <sighs> From my experience, the immersion and the roleplay suffered immensely compared to last year as a result. Individual roleplay or even small groups of roleplay was still fine, but because of the relaxed message of just be in character if you want to or don't, whatever, the end result was that a casual walk through the entire event grounds would have you seeing an equal amount of people that were in-game and also just out-of-game cracking jokes. So. 
sometimes a very disorienting experience, and I can only imagine what that must have felt like for a new player who was already struggling to find a foothold and figure out what was going on. And simple immersion and roleplay taking hit due to this disorienting experience were not the biggest issue. Because when you have people constantly breaking character in order to make a meme or a topical reference because the tone of the game has been set so lax, it leads players into not knowing whether or not who they're talking to is in character or out of character, which becomes a huge problem if an argument breaks out. There was no established and maintained barrier between our world in the game and the real world outside. There was generally not a real distinction between characters and players. Individuals were doing their best, but collectively, this is my diagnosis. There was not that safety net of we're allowed to roleplay here, and at the end of the day, everyone will just buy each other a drink and everything will be fine. So there were times when an argument would break out and one person would be in character and the other person would actually be upset for real and there was a new system of rules that was introduced to the game that would allow us to signal whether or not we were okay with the role play feeling kind of met about the role play or wanted the role play to stop because we were actually tilted but given that this new system of rules was not on the actual website and was announced to us in the safety briefing sort of just like in combination with all the other things that were told to us in that moment I have a feeling a lot of players simply forgot that was an option available to them. So there were moments where there were whole groups of players that were upset at other groups of players for not playing the game fair, even though by the rules that we had established and by the story that we knew existed, what had happened was totally fine. And this problem continued throughout the entire event. And just as a quick etiquette thing, in case you are new to LARPing or you have been LARPing for a while, but don't know this, um, don't make topical references to real world events during role play inside of the game. It kind of ruins the immersion in the role play for the people around you. I had a member of my group get so upset that it, it actually ruined the moment for her. There was something happening and an intense moment of role play and someone else in the, in the area made a COVID reference about having to keep six feet apart um, don't do that. It wasn't even like an actual safety thing. It was like, it was like a topical joke about keeping six feet apart. Like, just like, just don't do that. So I brought a party of seven friends, five of which this was their first LARP event ever. And the new players that I brought ended up being really confused for the better part of the entire first two days of the event. Some of them ended up figuring out and they just threw themselves in and they had a great time. Some of them simply resigned themselves to not knowing what was going on, but having the best time that they could. And one of them actually actually became quite distressed because she blamed herself for playing the game wrong and thought it was her fault that she didn't know what was going on and wasn't having a good time even though the game had failed to make clear to her what she was supposed to do and what was expected of her as a player. I had explained to my entire group of seven that with a LARP like this, something that is supposed to be high immersion, that once everyone else is in character, even if they're new, they will have that moment where they realize what is going on and then they will get it. But unfortunately for some of them, that light bulb moment never actually came simply because for them, the game never officially started started and they were constantly being pulled in game or out of game by the various people who happened to be around them at any given moment. Remember that these are people that are my friends, people that I'm very, very close to, who I helped and worked with personally to create their characters, backstories, personality kit, how they were going to role play, everything. One of them is also a trained actor like me, and they were still confused. Reckoning is supposed to be a game that focuses on player agency. It's been described Described, at least in concept as an open sandbox. Now what this means, I don't actually know because it's never been defined anywhere, and I think that especially new players need to be told what this means. I think there is a very, very big distinction between 
player agency, and player run. Which brings us to the open sandbox problem. Player agency would mean that you are free to engage with the established world and story how you wish to. Do or do not do various encounters as they are presented to you as your character would deem fit. And to some degree that your character's involvement or non-involvement in a given scenario might change the outcome of that scenario and influence the story of the game. Player run, which is what Reckoning ended up being, whether intentionally or unintentionally, means that it is up to all of the players collectively to make the game up. My group, I joined a new faction this year, the Vatican, who were awesome, love you guys, created this very extensive, huge Google file drive with information uh, about our histories, about all of our clans, about our backstories, what our different cultures were like, how they interacted, character ties, how everything all worked together, everything. Players were essentially required to create quests for each other if they wanted to have something to do, like, I don't know, go find a flower for the making of a potion or something. Here is the problem with that. The game itself does have an established lore. We just don't know what all of it is, because while some of it is on the website, and some of it was given to us via Instagram live streams or Discord posts, or told to us through word of mouth by other players that happened to know what it was for whatever reason, a lot of it is simply locked inside of the head of the game runner. And whatever the players create or come up with in order to run their own quests or have their own storylines isn't officially recognized by the game. This is incredibly confusing, because on the one hand we are being told and shown that we have agency, that creating stories and quests is essentially 70 to 80% entirely up to us, because if we don't do it then it won't exist, but on the other hand, we are also being told that if the players create something that doesn't fit with the game runner's vision for the established lore, then we have to retcon our choices in order to fit it. If the players, like the Vatican did, create an entire culture and social hierarchy for themselves, the game could at any time just create a random Vatican Lord NPC and insert him into the plot. This new off-screen character is someone that none of the actual Vatican have ever heard of, we don't have any connection to him, we don't know who he is, what importance he has to us. If someone else's clan stronghold simply was erased from the world due to the introduction of this new NPC, it's almost stressful. I spent a good deal of the event censoring my own choices and holding back what I wanted to do with my character because I didn't want to be forced into a position where my own agency as a player turned my character into a liar because I said something that didn't fit with the story that the game runner had planned. For example, there was a cursed sword, and if you touched it, you also became cursed and you essentially started attacking everybody around you and fighting your own people. Now, I had been told that this sword sword was an heirloom of a house, and that there might also be other heirloom swords within other factions that were also cursed. Now, I knew that I had written in my backstory that the sword that my character carried was a family heirloom, and this was available in the Google Drive. Lots of other people knew this if they chose to read it. So, was my sword cursed too? I don't know. It should be up to me, right? I have the player agency to create my own story. Well, um, I wasn't entirely sure that that was true. If it was full player agency, and I I felt safe in making that choice, I would have done it because it could have been really, really cool. I threw the sword onto the ground. This actually happened. I threw the sword onto the ground. I told everybody the history of it and said, I don't know if it's cursed. I just touched it. Uh, someone should surround me to make sure that I don't go crazy. And then we had, and then I had this really cool moment with a character named Magnus. Shout out to Magnus. Um, where we, w where I wouldn't let him touch the sword to decide if it was cursed because it was my family heirloom and I felt like I needed to be the one to touch it. But I was protected from cursed for the time. So there I was sitting on the ground, clutching my sword to my chest, surrounded by my own people with their spears at my throat. And Magnus and I had this really intense moment where ultimately I said I wasn't feeling the curse and I let him grab the blade of my sword so that he could determine if the sword was cursed too. 
And what I had decided was the sword wasn't cursed. And thankfully, what he decided was that the sword wasn't cursed. I don't know if he was just honoring my choice and following my lead, or if he had the same thought process as me, but I'm glad that ultimately the sword wasn't cursed because this was my thought process. I didn't know if the staff was equipped for us to start randomly injecting new cursed swords into the event that they hadn't planned for. I didn't know if my player agency and my choice to potentially make this sword cursed would actually break the game. But ultimately it doesn't matter because after the event I learned that this sword wasn't even staff run plot, it was created by another player, so I could have done whatever I wanted, I guess. But unfortunately what this means is that if you have players that are like me, and I'm not a unique player, there are players like me who understand that there always has to be this little meta part of your head that stays on, that we are playing a game and that the choices we make need to be filtered to a certain degree in order to make sure that the other players are still having fun and that we're not breaking the game. What this means is that for players like that, we are tailoring our own choices in order to fit the vision of the game runner and that is literally the opposite of agency. It is completely backwards. And the other edge of the sword means that the players that are not filtering their choices to some degree and attempting to figure out the mechanical consequences of the decisions that they make, um, that it means that these players are either inexperienced, meaning that they are even more likely to break the game because they are actually doing whatever they want, or they are players that have inside knowledge because they have a direct line to the game runner or the writing staff personally. And for me, that's wrong. It's completely backwards. And the very sad result is that the awesome role play that I had with Magnus um, or any of the lore, frankly, or the backstories that any of us created or wrote about ourselves or our families or our houses or our clans is actually collectively meaningless because we have agency only as long as what we choose to do is ultimately inconsequential. Now, I don't mind games where I have agency. I like games that have agency if the game is set up for it. I also don't mind playing games that have a highly curated and controlled story and I'm there to role play within the confines of it. I just want to know what kind of game I'm playing. I don't like being told that I have agency when actually I don't. I said this in my critique of The Witcher Season 1, and this is the exact same problem. When the players or the viewer are confused, what ultimately happens is that I just have to sit back and wait for you to tell me what is happening, which is exactly what I wanted to happen in the first place, except now I'm less interested and more annoyed. Because sandboxes have walls, there are rules, there are boundaries. You have to stay inside of the sandbox. You have to play with the sand. You have to play with the other toys that have been given to you or the ones that you brought. But in this case, it feels like being brought into a field, being told to build a sandbox, and then once I'm done, having to ask permission about what types of things I'm allowed to build with the sand that I bought. In the best case scenario, even if we did have full player agency without having to worry about retconning our choices, this results in utter chaos where players with different visions for what the game and what the story should be are fighting for supremacy over whose interpretation of things is correct. In some cases, even down to what physical objects even are or what they mean or what they represent. You could have two players say completely contradictory things on opposite sides of the event venue, and both of those things are equally true or false at the same time. It is chaos. Now, it might be more realistic to have that level of miscommunication, but it isn't fun. Because when you let 300 people loose in a field with no direction and no leader, they are going to get confused. And this is honestly the biggest problem with the event. Are we playing in an open sandbox or aren't we? And if we are, can we please have all of the relevant information necessary that we need in order to craft the story ourselves properly? Because at the moment, we create our own mini inconsequential quests, plot lines, and stories, and then there is the main plot which is actually happening. But there is a main plot, we just don't really know what it is. And instead of being able to use our player agency to determine how we would like to engage with the plot or solve the problems set before us by the plot or interact with the world at large, we are using our player agency to first figure out if there is a plot, and if so, what the plot even is in the first place before we can even play the game. Playing the game. The mechanics and rules.
Reckoning is focused almost entirely on the combat. I can appreciate the incredibly streamlined class system from a certain point of view, but the result of it is that every single class is absolutely dependent on combat happening. Any roleplay that you choose to do outside of partaking in the combat is mechanically unsupported at best and narratively irrelevant at worst. In Reckoning, there are three main classes. There are fighters, sages, and then the artisans, who are the support classes. The fighters are able to use all types of weapons and armor, and the limits for what you are allowed to use are dictated by what faction you have chosen. Sages are allowed to use smaller weapons and a handful of spells. It is a very low magic system with no combat magic, which I understand and get behind, especially for the purposes of this specific game, because the point is to ensure that you can visually gauge a threat level by looking at it and minimize the amount of mental math that you would have to do for things like damage spells and avoid the lightning bolt scenario. Unfortunately, this has resulted in a grand total of six spells that are available to all of the sages. A heal spell, a sage armor spell, which grants magical armor two points per limb, a protection from cursed spell, a friends spell, a bane spell, a great healing spell, which heals four people, and the divination spell. The spells are available to any player of any faction at any time who is a sage, and the amount of roleplay and what type of roleplay you choose to do are left entirely up to the players. On the one hand, allowing players to decide how they would like their magic to manifest creates a neat world that gives players the agency to create their own flavor of magic, but really what they are doing is changing the color of the magic and the flavor is remaining invariably the same, because the effects do not change. And at the end of the day, roleplay is not inherently necessary or even obviously encouraged by the game itself, as the only mechanical requirement for casting a spell is that you rip the spell card in half when you cast it, and sometimes that is all people do. The artisans also have three subclasses. There are the potion smiths who create healing potions, the spell scribes who create the spells that the sages then purchase from them and are able to use, and the bone knitters who heal people. Healing potions and bone knitters function identically within the mechanics of the game, so the classes all exist to support and enable the combat. The fighters do the fighting, the sages can fight and the spells that they cast generally augment the fighters, heal the fighters, or prevent other fighters from entering the fight. The two spells which are social mostly in nature are the friends spell and the divination spell. In many systems where something like a friends spell is used, where you cast it on a person and they are supposed to act as your friend for a given duration of time, um, are easily misunderstood or abused in those systems if they are not closely monitored and an explanation of about exactly how this spell is supposed to work and what it actually does is given. And many people treat being under the influence of a friend's spell as if being somebody's friend immediately drops your IQ and survival instincts to zero. So it is either a get out of jail free card or it is completely useless. The divination spell is essentially a very expensive piece of paper that upon ripping it allows you to ask a staff member to please tell you what the plot is. The artisans also have the same problem as the sages, in that they are allowed to roleplay how they would like their powers to manifest if they would like to, but mechanically there is no difference between the outcomes and no real incentive to actually create the roleplay, and not enough resources, especially for new players, to know that they can do that, that they should, or how to create that roleplay. The way that potion smiths and spell scribes both work is that they have to go to the game logistics area in order to purchase the items and restock their own supply from one of the staff members. They pay in-game money to the staff who then provide them with the cards for the spells or the potion bottles. So it doesn't matter how much time and effort you put into role-playing that you're crafting a potion, you could spend a whole lot of time and money creating your own personalized alchemy kit and then role-playing with it and using it however you want in order to create your potion, but at the end of the day, you still have to go and purchase the physical potion from the logistics team. The role-play that you do does not physically result in you creating the item. Whatever quests you would like to run in order to gather ingredients for, say, a potion are absolutely meaningless because they also do not contribute to you 
actually crafting the item with that ingredient. In fact, the economy itself within the game discourages that type of roleplay because if you send people on a quest to find an ingredient, you have to reward them, or you probably should at least, with the money that you need in order to pay logistics for the potion. And the only reason that players even need the money in the first place is to purchase the potion from you. And the only reason that they need the potion is to go on quests in the first place, and as we have established, the entire thing is cyclically meaningless. You could eliminate both of these artisan classes and simply have the fighters and the sages purchase their potions and their spell cards from logistics directly, and the game wouldn't change at all. And that must be really sad for the players who wanted to play those classes, because they're essentially just middlemen. Players who wanted to smith potions or craft spells, they're not really doing those things, they're essentially running a retail business. Which means that of the three support classes available to people who don't want to be directly engaged in combat, the Bone Knitters are the only one with independent powers. The power to heal people from combat which is the same thing that potions do mechanically, and it creates another problem, because it makes all death absolutely meaningless. In Reckoning, character death is a player choice, which to some level I appreciate because it would really be a bummer to spend a whole lot of time and money investing it into a character and then writing that character only to trip on the battlefield and be gone from existence forever. Again, realistic, but not fun. So I get the intention behind this mechanic, but when the worst that happens to you when you die is that you have to spend one silver and wait a maximum of 60 seconds to be summoned back to life, none of your actions have any consequences. Want to assassinate a political figure and drastically change the course of history? It's actually impossible. Have a bounty on somebody? It's meaningless because they're not going to stay dead. You want to go out in a blaze of glory? You've sacrificed nothing. It is only if you choose to die that you actually do. Meaning that this creates a very large plot hole within the world of the game as to why the bone knitting powers or why the potion didn't work on you for this particular moment for some reason. And the only people you really can kill are the NPCs who are meant to be killed and theoretically could also just come back, or off-screen characters who were made up and didn't matter anyway. I even had a friend at the event who chose to have his character die and was told not to do that that by the staff because it screwed with a plotline that they had planned. Where is the agency? And any scars or trauma or consequences you choose to impose upon yourself as a result of dying and being brought back are not supported by the mechanics or the lore of the game. You end up putting yourself at a disadvantage for absolutely no reason. The lore of the Bone Knitters is that they bring you back with no scars at all. They are supposed to bring you back exactly how you were before you died. It is in the rules. It is written this way. It is known, Khaleesi. So just like choosing to come up with a roleplay for spells, or crafting your spells, or potions, or your backstory, or anything, it is all just flavor text. It is the reskin of a weapon in a video game that doesn't physically affect its stats. There is no reason or incentive to do it other than that it's a roleplaying game and you should because it's cool. But at the end of the day, it's something you choose to impose upon the game itself, and it only has meaning because you decided that it did. At its most fundamental basic building block level, yes, LARP is a game where everyone gets together and agrees that the made-up stuff is true, but it shouldn't feel like that while you're playing it. And it's especially frustrating because there are ways to give death meaning and weight while still keeping the game balanced and fair without removing all of the consequences entirely. Even having Bone Knitters be a limited class so that the healing resources within the world are limited could accomplish this. In fact, this happened during the game by accident because they ran out of certain spell cards and the potion bottles. I assume what happened was uh, either the spell scribes or the potion smiths went over to logistics, tried to restock, and were told, we're out. And then were told to relay that information to the rest of the player base. So people went around out of game just 
notifying the players that these spells are gone and there's no more potions. And I asked, because I was curious, was this done as a mechanic of the game in order to help influence the story and raise the stakes and the tension? And I was told that no, they really are just out of those things. And I assume the person that I asked was simply repeating what they were told, and that ultimately comes from the game runner, so I do not blame the person that I ask for what I'm about to say. But, one, why not just tell everyone that this is part of the story in order to encourage us to roleplay with it? Stuff happens, I get it. You didn't print enough of a particular card, it got pulled out, and now there aren't any of them left. Fine, but roll with it. Incorporate it into the story, incorporate it into the plot. This is a chance to rebalance the game. Or better yet, especially in the case of the spell scribes, let them actually do their supposed job. You have an entire class of people that are supposed to create spells. Let them grab a piece of paper and write them down. The logistics team ran out of the Bane spell, so now it simply just no longer exists. Poof, it's gone with no in-world explanation. It's just, it just, we don't have any more, so deal with it. What? You have an entire class dedicated to, to crafting sage spells. Let them do it. And ultimately, we had players just making up brand new spells and rituals right on the spot, and then having them approved by the game runner in real time. So why couldn't we just make new Bane spells. Like, can anybody just make new spells? Are, are we supposed to be able to do this? If we are, why doesn't it say that this is an option available to us in the rules of the game? And if we aren't allowed to do it, then why were some people allowed to do it, given that it resulted in other players feeling left out and like their chosen classes were worthless? Which brings us to the plot. I will break down the plot, but understand that because of the nature of this game, I don't actually know what happened. Because there has been no official write-up of the event or the story that took place during the game or anything. There is no canon, just everyone's collective or individual interpretations of what happened. Or if there is a canon, I don't know how to find it because it's not on the website. <sighs> and also know that the story plot for Reckoning 2 was essentially identical to Reckoning 1. All the factions assembled for reasons, and then we bickered and squabbled together until the orcs were told to arrive, and then they did, and then we united and we beat them, and then we returned to squabbling amongst ourselves. Now that I think about it, that's also a little bit like the end of Game of Thrones. So last year, all the factions were gathered together in order to celebrate a one-year anniversary for the peace treaty between two of the factions. This year, we were all there in order to help unravel the mystery of an entire city's worth of people disappearing. Though this event didn't actually take place in or near that city. I honestly don't know where we were or why we were there. They did say the name of the place at the safety meeting before the event, but it's not on the map and there's no lore written about it or who controls it or what it's for, but we were at some kind of fort. We were there at the behest of Viscount Merrick, the son of the leader of the Rivlins, and he wanted us all to help unravel the mystery of these disappeared people. I'm not entirely sure why the leader of one faction actually has the power to summon people from other factions to his aid, but if we don't answer the call for aid, the game doesn't happen, so I get it. Anyway, we were all there, and a new mechanic was introduced this year, a sort of a capture the flag style system, where there were these gold bars that would be hidden around the property, and NPCs could also be carrying gold, and each one of the factions would have a chest in their faction camp, and those chests were meant to contain the gold. Now, I don't know what the gold does or why it's actually important, because the in-game currency is silver, and while you can convert silver to gold in order to boost the number of gold that you have, you can't actually use it to purchase anything other than to give it to other factions in exchange for favors. But I suppose that ultimately the goal was just to have as much gold as possible, even though it didn't actually result in any tangible benefit. It was essentially the equivalent of an NFT. This mechanic was introduced to create interfactional conflict because that was where the majority of the game and the combat would come from until the orcs were told to arrive in a couple of days. So this means that we were all there to help the Viscount unravel the mystery of an entire city that disappeared, and the only new mechanic that we were given was introduced to us in order to make us fight against each other for no discernible reason. 
this is confusing. Over the course of the first two days, there was no staff run plot. This has been officially confirmed, either because it wasn't planned to begin with or because it was canceled in real time during the event. Everything else that happened during those first two days was because the players decided to do stuff. It was a small multifactional contingency, which I was a part of, which was trying to unravel the mystery of these disappearing people and caravans. During the day, each one of these factions would compile all of the information that they had learned about these disappearances, and then we, the three representatives of each faction, would meet every night in order to discuss those findings. Most of these findings came about via use of the divination spell, which you remember is the piece of paper that allows you to ask the staff to tell you what the plot is. So all of this sleuthing resulted in us learning the following information, that the orcs were controlled by a necromancer, that the necromancer was responsible for the disappearances, and that all of the people that disappeared are dead. GG. There's no saving them or anything or what they were used for, they're just gone. Eventually, there was this cursed sword that was introduced, which I have since learned was a player-led plot, not one created by the actual game runner. This sword was reportedly left in one of the caravans, that's how the player characters found it, and it was concluded that this sword was planted in the caravans by the orcs at the behest of the necromancer so that we would find it, be cursed by it, and then weaken ourselves. The sword was apparently also important to one of the factions, the Rivlins, as it was an heirloom to their ruling house, and whoever held the sword had the claim to that portion of the land. This is what the players that created that story decided about the sword. This will become relevant later. Ultimately, the orcs came and attacked us because they wanted the sword back so they could control the land. I found this strange at the time because if they wanted it, it wouldn't really have made sense for them to give it to us in the first place. But now understanding that that wasn't even a staff planned thing, it was something that was incorporated based on what a player suggested, that makes a bit more sense. But it also makes me wonder what the plot was even supposed to be in the first place. Because if the orcs were there for the sword, and the sword was only introduced after the game started, then why were the orcs originally there? Anyway, our goal for the final day after learning this information was to cure the sword of its curse that was being held by the necromancer and beat back the orcs so that they couldn't have it. They attacked us on Saturday afternoon and absolutely trounced us. My full respect and love goes to those orcs, there will be more about them too. Narratively, I agree with the fact that the orcs beat us. The players needed to be shown that there was a real threat and be given cause to unite, despite the fact that the gold mechanic, the only new mechanic which was introduced, was introduced for the purpose of dividing us in the first place. But the problem here is that I have since learned that at least some of the orcs were told that they were supposed to beat us. Do you see the problem here? This is again supposed to be a player agency led game. The orcs were told to beat us, so they did. We were supposed to lose, so so we did. So that kind of makes it a bit like a cutscene, and I thoroughly enjoyed the cutscene, but the much deeper problem is that it happened at all. Do we have agency, or don't we? Just pick one and tell us which one it is. So after the orcs beat us on Saturday afternoon, everyone geared up because we were going to fight them again Saturday night. So we beat the orcs back, and then everyone immediately started squabbling over this sword. You see, the Vatican were told that this sword represented rulership over a certain piece of land, and we were given that sword by another faction, the Suzak Mar, as a gesture of friendship, and the Suzak Mar were given that sword by the Hadrian faction, also as a gesture of friendship, and it was also Hadrian players that came up with the sword story but the sword itself within the story belonged to the Rivlins. So even though some of those players didn't know that the sword existed until that very day, they wanted it back. And the Rivlins, some of them, decided that the sword held less of a political significance and more of an emotional cultural one, and that it represented not the rulership over the piece of land, as was originally told to us, but in fact just represented their memories of their fallen heroes, and that they deserved to have it back. And so then we had another instance of players deciding on two conflicting truths and then having to fight in real time over who was correct because there was no 
actual official ruling on the story. And the game devolves into groups of players, players, not characters, but the players themselves fighting over whose interpretation of the lore is correct, whose direction for the story we should take, and that's not good, because it builds animosity between the actual player base as we are all struggling to find the firm ground to stand on because there is no one actually who knows anything unless they have inside information. The official story that Reckoning presented, at least as I was able to experience it, and I have been told that there wasn't anything else by people who ran the game, not including the curses and the curing of the sword because that was all player injected, which is great because it added to the game. The actual story that Reckoning presented was that there that we were all there in order to investigate disappearances. The orcs caused them because a necromancer told them to. We then beat the orcs. The end. Kind of. The end of the battle was a little bit strange. It was both climactic and also not, because after we won, we had that epic moment when everyone was cheering for victory, and then we received conflicting information that there may or may not be a second wave. This conflicting information about whether or not the battle was actually over led many people to just stand around outside of the castle waiting to see if anything else was going to happen. Again, realistic? Yes. But fun and climactic? No. Remember, this is supposed to be a story. Which brings us to logistics and communication. Introducing a big bad NPC faction in what is supposed to be an interfactional PvP and political intrigue game is also a little bit confusing. Because at this point, the players and the characters all know that the orcs exist and that other cursed creatures exist and they pose an existential threat to humanity. We know that uniting the factions is pretty much necessary for everyone's collective survival. So you have players running around trying to forge alliances for the coming end of times, but then the game itself encouraging us to fight against each other via introductions of mechanics like the gold bars because otherwise there would be no PvP. The start of the battle was a little bit strange too. Remember how the entire point of the battle was that we had a sword that was cursed, the orcs wanted it, and we wanted to cure it so they would no longer want it anymore? Well, the ritual was supposed to take 10 minutes. The orcs were supposed to stop us from attempting to complete it, but due to either poor or lack of communication, the ritual ended before the orcs were even told that it had started. That is not the orcs' fault. They were just as upset about it as we were, if not more so. So the ritual ended and then the rest of us were just standing in our shield formation outside the castle, keeping the energy up but wondering what was going on, and then eventually when someone was able to relay this information to the orcs, then the battle began, and we essentially fought not because there was a reason or a goal at this point, but just because it's what everybody expected. And I really do want to stress that this is not the fault of the orcs. It is a problem with the way the encounter was run. And it was a great fight, it felt very cool to be a part of in the moment. But I can't help but feel for the orcs, who were there literally to provide us with a cool and very intense story moment, and then were deprived of their ability to do that that because of a poor relay of information to them. Like, these, these poor guys, their purpose at this game is to have fun by allowing us to have fun while fighting them. That is an incredibly selfless and giving attitude of them to have. Like, I'm an actor, I get it. And to not be given the resources and support that they needed in order to do what they were there to do, what they wanted to do, and what they do incredibly well when left to their own devices to the best of their ability, really just, it's just disappointing. Other logistical issues included how we learned about certain mechanics and rules just through the grapevine. This cursed sword mechanic turned you into an NPC, essentially, and would turn you against your own side if you decided to touch it. If you were killed by someone that was cursed, you were also supposed to become cursed. Nobody knew that, again, because this was introduced in the middle of the game. So some people who found out about that did get knocked down, and then they got up and they were cursed, and other people got knocked down, and then they just got up and they were fine because they didn't know they were supposed to be cursed. And because all of this information was relayed to us via word of mouth, via telephone, given how telephone works, it inevitably ended up with a huge problem, which is that people thought that if you were cursed, your weapon became cursed. And that meant that we had players taking weapons from other players in order to prevent the curse from spreading. Telling people both to do and then not to do that 
also came through word of mouth. And because this cursed sword was introduced by the players, and again, I'm not harping on the players for introducing that. That was cool that they did that. But naturally, the solution to that was also introduced by other players. This spell to cure the cursed people was approved on the spot, and then the rest of us simply learned how this new mechanic was going to work through the telephone. The way that it worked was not explained proficiently or adequately or correctly to everybody, leading some players to believe that they couldn't use the ritual spell to cure cursed people even though they could because people who didn't know how the spell worked tried to explain it to them. Are you confused yet? The game runner did eventually have to pause the game in order to make an announcement during dinner about how he had decided this new spell was going to work inside of the game and it is very good that he decided to do this because it was very understandably the cause for some people feeling like they were being excluded from the game. How much damage the orcs actually actually dealt and how we were supposed to fight against them was also explained during the game, not during the safety briefing and also not clearly in the rules on the website. They do two damage even with one-handed weapons, which is not the same rules that the human beings follow. And that was not stated in the actual rule section about fighting cursed creatures on the website. The orcs were understandably very frustrated about killing people who did not die because they didn't know the rules, and I also did not realize this, so orcs, I am sorry. Though in my defense, I generally tend to die with the benefit of the doubt. The idea being that if I feel a couple hits hit me in succession, I'm just going to decide to go down. That's like the etiquette that I follow, it's the etiquette that a lot of players follow, it's not the new players' faults that they don't know the rules about fighting the orcs, it's not the new players' faults that they don't know that etiquette of just sort of taking the L when you take the L. They needed to be taught that, the game didn't teach them that, so that brings us to the orcs. As a result of the mismanagement, the safety issues, among some other things, the orc faction is leaving Reckoning. I have spoken with some of them personally in quite high positions, and while that is sad for the game that they are choosing to leave, I think they are making the right decision for themselves. Nartum Call, which is this orc group, is a essentially professional orc tribe. Those guys are absolutely amazing. They have incredibly high standard kit, weapons, costumes, and they made both games. They saved both games, one might say. Their costumes, weapons, and kits are not assets of the game. They belong to the people playing the orcs. They are essentially just other players who just volunteered to be epic NPCs for the rest of us to fight because it brings them joy to do that. They were awesome. They gave it their all and they have my utter and absolute respect. But unfortunately, that is another huge problem for the game because they got a slight discount on the tickets, those orcs. They were essentially just other players. They weren't staff, they weren't necessarily even affiliated with the game specifically as their own entity of Nartum Call. It's it's a, it's its own thing. And they go to lots of different types of games. Yet they were essentially the thing that made Reckoning special. Reckoning relied on them to carry the game, but then didn't support them logistically. These guys are in layers and layers of chainmail and cloth and dark leather and prosthetic masks running around in the midday sun in battles where they are outnumbered 20 to 1 and they didn't even originally have water available to them in their staging area. These guys took a staggering amount of headshots. Headshots are illegal in Reckoning. One orc reportedly had someone try to actually jump on top of him and it ended up with that orc being injured. I don't think it was terribly bad, but that doesn't mean that it's not annoying and unacceptable. These guys were the greatest asset that Reckoning had, and they weren't even really an asset that Reckoning physically possessed. They just chose to be there and paid for the tickets. And now they have chosen not to attend the event again, and I don't blame them. And if any of you happen to be watching this video, I, I'll just apologize right now. If I ever hit any of you in the head, I don't think I did, but if I did, man, I'm really, really sorry. You guys just you guys rocked it, and you deserved better. Thank you for your service, and I wish you well on your future endeavors. I really hope we get to play together again. Lack of communication before, during, and then after the event. Over the course of the year between games 1 and 2, we got a few lore drops and one new rules update, at least as far as I'm aware, again because these updates are done via either the Discord or Instagram livestream, not via the website or email notification. I do not understand 
why Discord and Instagram are the medium for disseminating this very important information. So we were supposed to send in pictures of our kit for approval to make sure that it all fit within the confines of the game world. None of the players that I was bringing personally received a response via email to those kit submissions, including me. Volunteers and members of staff stepped up and were approving people's kits via the Discord, so thank you guys for stepping up. Though despite these efforts by the volunteers, and that is essentially what they were because none of the staff were paid, there were still people wearing like modern leggings and things like that. So either those got checked and approved or they weren't approved and then they were being worn anyway. Even some of my friends commented to me that I was harping on them for like needing to get medieval appropriate footwear or they wouldn't be allowed in the game because this is a high immersion game that highly values its immersive aesthetic. And that it ended up not really making that much of a difference when we got there because it, it just, it wasn't a top priority. I guess. The staff was stretched too thin. I don't know what it was, but immersion took a big hit, and I kind of felt silly for making my friends, like, get all of this extra stuff so they could be historically accurate and appropriate when it wasn't ultimately necessary. So, in the few weeks leading directly up to the event, there were a few extra lore drops, but they were mostly vague setups that amounted to stuff is disappearing. I think there was more stuff that was planned and that had been written, but ultimately there was only one person that has direct access to officially releasing that information. That is the game runner. He chose not to do that for whatever reason. So that's pretty much all that we got. And then the days leading up to the events, we just didn't hear anything at all. During the event, as I have already shown, a communication between the event runner, the staff, and the NPCs clearly broke down somewhere along the chain multiple times, and players were informing each other about how new rules and mechanics worked during the game as they just happened to pop up. The biggest problem here, I keep saying that, they're just, they're, they're a lot of problems. At the time of filming this, the staff has not had a debriefing with the game runner about the event. It has been over a month since the game ended. How has this not happened yet? We sent in our player surveys where I said a very condensed version of what it is that I'm saying in this video. And we had the surveys last year, and just given how little has been changed and implemented from last year to this year, I'm not even sure how much weight the player surveys even have in the first place. And it is just astounding to me that nothing, no email, no statement, not even a ping in the Discord, has been made to tie up the story of the game or thank the players for attending or at the very least explain what happened with the catering and, I don't know, apologize for it and explain what it is that you're doing in the future to fix that problem. The bottom line is that this is not at the level that we should expect from a LARP with this kind of price tag or even LARPs with lower price tags. It's way more than just growing pains. There are some very fundamental issues with the core system that this game is built on. This is not what this LARP has the potential to be. This is not what LARPing in general has the potential to be. And it is also not on par with what LARPing already is is in many other games. That doesn't mean that it won't be or that it can't be in the future. It, it, like, these aren't unfixable problems, but they do persist. Which brings me to my final point. You, you are the reason that I am making this video. My audience is to be fully transparent with you. So when anyone came up to me during the event and introduced themselves and, and met me and said, like, this is great, I'm here because of you, and there were a fair number of you, and it was great to meet all of you, and I really hope that we can play again sometime. I, I quite honestly felt guilty, because Reckoning in its current state is not up to my standards. And I feel especially bad and responsible for the players that found Reckoning through me, and because of me, and that were either confused, disappointed, or felt taken advantage of, because I felt all of those things this year. People that maybe now won't try other LARPs because they didn't like this one and think that LARPing isn't for them, were maybe told that that was their own fault, that they didn't have fun because they didn't get it, or because they were playing the game wrong or weren't using their agency correctly, so that's why they didn't enjoy it. I will say this, come the consequences that may. You didn't do anything wrong if you didn't have a good time. The tools and training which were necessary to set you up for success were not provided to you. Not all LARPs are like this, and there are various games that exist that meet an incredibly high standard that suit all manner of different play styles and needs, and you shouldn't feel wrong or bad because you expected more from a game 
game that you paid for. It doesn't mean that if you want to go that you can't or that you shouldn't or that if you had a fun time that I'm invalidating your experience, certainly not. I think that the community of players at Reckoning is fantastic. I think that the volunteers are fantastic. There is a lot of passion. There is a lot of dedication. There is a will to have this game succeed. And maybe I simply have a bad attitude or I'm a quitter for not trying to help fix the thing or something. But I can't, and I don't think we should, be asked to help fundamentally fix a game that we don't run. The staff don't even have the power to fix it at the moment because they lack the control they need in order to do so. Honestly, we shouldn't be forced into a position where we feel the need to fix and save and run a game that we are paying somebody else to run. I'm going off script. Stop what you're doing listening to me. This is very important. And I am assuming there are gonna be other people from other LARPs that have similar stories uh, that I encourage you to share in the comments because this is a lesson that I think we need to learn. And I'll and I'll put it in a way that hopefully is, is maybe a little bit removed so that no one feels like I'm personally attacking them because again, that is never my intention. Um, I'm an actor. Say I was in a show, right? And I either don't like the show that we are currently doing or I don't like the way that the director is directing it. It is not my place to do the job of the director to change the blocking that the director has set out for us. It is not my place to go. I don't like the way this line sounds. I'm going to change it without asking for permission to step in and start changing things because you think they can be done better. Even if you're right, I need to know what my lane is and I need to stay in it. I am an actor when it comes to the game. I am a player. That is my role and that should be my only role. If there's an issue with the director, you either go to the director or you go to the stage manager or you go to the producer and you tell that person what the issue is and then you hope that it gets fixed. And if it does, fantastic. And if it doesn't, then you are faced with the choice of either dealing with the fact that things are not being run the way that you would like them to be run or you can remove yourself from the production. Those are the only only two options. And once it starts happening again, if it's not stopped immediately, it is going to eventually become a slippery slope where it becomes a faction of players versus the staff itself. And that is not sustainable for a game to exist. It's not supposed to be like that. And if I were to try to help fix the game, it would run into a number of problems. One, nobody asked for my help. Two, I would then be in a position where I'm potentially working against other people that have a different vision. None of us run the game, so it's really ultimately none of our business. Three, if I were to even try to take control, it would end up be having the game be about me and how I'm fixing it, which I refuse to do. It would be incredibly egotistical to try to do that. And four, doing so would also be condoning that it is normal for games to be run like this. It is not normal, and even if it were, that wouldn't make it right. So as it stands, unless some serious and very tangible evidence is produced that the core systems of Reckoning are changing to outline the boundaries of what is expected from players and what we are allowed to do and what we should not do, provide proper new player training and support, the catering issues have been fixed, the safety issues have been fixed, all these, all of these speed bumps have been ironed out, then, then, then I might consider going back. But until then, I will not be returning to Reckoning. It is at, le at the very least far too expensive and far too far of a drive for me compared to what I get out of the experience. As much as I love all of the new friends that I made. It, it hurts to have to say that I'm leaving the game. It does. Because I don't want people to feel like I'm betraying them or something. That, like, that... This is such a tough video. So now I will take the time to answer the question that I know many people are likely to ask because a number of people have already asked it, and that is, will I start my own LARP event? Maybe. One day, very far in the future. It's a fun thought experiment, and, and I've obviously thrown around ideas for different rule systems I might use since I was a kid just because I thought it was fun. I, I at this point think I know how, how I would do it or at least how I would approach it and maybe I would even do a good job. But I wouldn't want to start something unless I was dang sure I was going to get it right starting from day one. I mean, I started LARPing when I was 14 years old and even in my off years, I did a lot of research about how different LARPs are structured, what works, what doesn't, what people have already tried, what types of games there are. I mean, I'm also an actor. I am literally trained to perform professionally. I have directed, I have analyzed scripts. I know how to write stories. I'm a DM, I have taught others. I have a particular set of skills, one might say. And I am still not confident that I have the necessary knowledge, resources, or experience to handle a game that is meant to serve other people, at least not yet. And until I am, I'm not even going to try because it would be 
it would be rude of me to do that to you. So I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm starting to slur my words. I've been filming for over three hours at this point. I feel like I've said everything I need to say. So I will see you soon, whether in a new video or perhaps at a game somewhere sometime. I've really enjoyed getting to meet everyone. The experience of just having that community really, really is fantastic and meeting everyone in person. So I'll see you soon. And in the meantime, I would like to wish you very sincerely, good luck on your adventures wherever they may take you.